Greetings, everyone, and welcome to your last video lecture of the semester. We've we've made it. This week we're dealing with uh, Dick Hebdige and selections from his book uh, Subculture: The Meaning of Style. And and as the title page here suggests, we're dealing with subcultures, uh, oftentimes called co-cultures now, which are uh, just cultures that exist within larger cultures, and resistance. So to get started, you know I always like to tell you a little bit about the, the author that we're reading, and so this is Dick Hebdige here, uh, one of the coolest, uh, in my humble opinion, people in, in uh, academics. So he's an English media theorist and sociologist, uh, and now is Professor Emeritus of Art and Media Studies at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, again, he's, his work is commonly associated with subcultures, and, uh, and the resistance against the mainstream of society. And as you probably gathered from reading uh, this selection uh, from Subculture, he's, he definitely has an interest in music, particularly the punk movement of the 1970s in Britain, uh, along with uh, reggae and ska and, and some other interesting musical movements. So in terms of what he's trying to do here, you know, I always try and, and let you know what, what's happening in the article. And so he's trying to, to take a semiotic approach to understanding the punk movement as it occurred in Great Britain. And he's specifically concerned with the process of subcultural meaning making. So how, me, how meaning circulates, how it's made uh, within the context of this one particular time and place. Right. Uh, so the England of the, the late 1970s, early 1980s or Great Britain more generally, uh, was a place that uh, had a conservative government. Margaret Thatcher was in charge of the, the government. She was prime minister. And in, in many uh, ways, she was sort of the, uh, uh, the British equivalent of Ronald Reagan in the United States. So uh, very conservative. Uh, but at the same time, the, the, the United Kingdom itself was experiencing a number of economic hardships. You had uh, many of the industrial jobs leaving. Uh, traditionally industrial towns and cities in England and, uh, and the other UK countries. And it created a kind of atmosphere of, uh, I don't know, a lack of hope, let's say, uh, for many of the young people in England at the time who, who knew that they couldn't go and get the same kinds of good factory jobs that their parents got. So there was, there was definitely a kind of uh, feeling of discouragement, a, a general a malaise that, that sort of set about the country. And, and Hebdige is interested in exploring punk as its kind of reaction to, to these economic circumstances. So he begins his, his discussion uh, with a talk about subcultures. And again, typically today we don't call them subcultures. Uh, typically, they're called co-cultures. This is part of the politically correct uh, style of uh, speech, you know, that's that's come about in the past twenty or thirty years. And and but the the idea is the same. And the idea is that there are smaller cultures that exist within larger cultures. And and you know, it used to be that we called these uh, subcultures. And so Hebdige is trying to get at the heart of what what these things are, right? And he, so he tells us subcultures represent noise as opposed to sound. Interference in the orderly sequence, which leads from real events and phenomena to the representation in the media. So here he's using noise in the way that communication scholars do, and noise is anything, uh, in communications, noise is anything that interferes with the transmission of a message, right? So it can be uh, things like static or, uh, you know, outside sounds, like if someone's jackhammering outside the classroom and you can't hear what I'm saying, that would, those would both be examples of noise. And so he says that subcultures function kind of like noise within, within the larger culture. And he goes on and he says, subcultures express forbidden contents. So when he says forbidden here, he doesn't mean that they're, they're actually forbidden by the government to speak about such things or anything like that. Rather, it's things that people generally don't talk about in polite society. So things like consciousness of class, consciousness of difference. And, and so he says that this is, uh, they do so. Right, they express forbidden contents in forbidden forms. They transgress uh, sartorial codes, behavioral codes. They break laws, etc. And he says they are profane articulations, and they are often and significantly defined as "quote unquote" unnatural. And so, of course, you you can kind of get this idea here from this picture of Sid Vicious. Uh, famously the front man for the Sex Pistols in, in the United Kingdom during this period that. Hebdige is exploring. And, and so, you know, he says what they're doing is they're, they're 
They're playing with ideas that typically it's not polite to talk about or, to, or even to think about. And they're playing with them in, in interesting ways, in part through the way that they dress, the way that they behave, uh, the breaking of laws and so on. And, and so this is why he calls them profane articulations, which I, I think is just a wonderful uh, phrasing, right? It's, it's really cool. Uh, and he says, you know, they come across as unnatural, which of course they would, right? And part of the reason that I highlight this segment here is because, you know, Gramsci and others, uh, Althusser, uh, Marx, you know, have told us repeatedly that, that the job of ideology is to make make the status quo seem natural. And so for Hebdige, what's happening here is that these these punk folks, right, are, are, are trying to, to bring attention to ideology, right? And, and one of the ways they do it is through behavior that seems unnatural, and of course it does, because it flies in the face of, of common sense, right, as, as, as Gramsci famously described it. So he tells us, subcultures breach our expectancies because they represent symbolic challenges to a symbolic order. And as a result, the emergence of a subculture is typically greeted by a wave of hysteria in the press. So what happens is when you see one of these subcultures gaining traction, the newspapers, the newscasters, TV news, cable news, and so on, presents them uh, in, in kind of an hysterical way, meaning that, you know, oh, look at these people, aren't they scary, right? Uh, so he, he goes on and he, he elaborates on this notion of hysteria, and he says it takes two forms, dread and fascination, like, oh my God, aren't these people scary and awful, look at them, and then outrage and amusement. Uh, so people get really mad about these subcultures, but they're also people tell jokes about them, right? And so he says, style in particular provokes a double response. It's celebrated in the fashion page and ridiculed or reviled in those articles which define subcultures as social problems. So one of the major ways that uh, hopefully you've seen by now that, that Hebdige thinks that subculture expresses itself is through what he calls sartorial codes, which is the fancy way of saying how people dress, the clothes that they wear. And, and this, of course, is style. And he says, you know, this style uh, in particular, which is the main form of expression for this kind of movement, is celebrated sometimes, right? The, the, the trendsetters and the fashion folks celebrate it. Uh, but, the, the, you know, the more conservative traditional media types uh, point to it and say, oh, this is, you know, really, really disgusting and awful. And can you believe these people look like this kind of thing? You know, or would dress like this or, or have their noses pierced or have tattoos or eat, right? I mean, you sort of get the idea. So he says what, what first attracts the attention of the press are, are what he calls stylistic innovations. So, so people dressing in new ways uh, that catch the attention of the general populace. So, you know, you can sort of tell here, right, that there's, you know, this girl's punk appearance is definitely catching the attention of this person over here. And so the idea is that the press is... is, is attracted at first by the stylistic innovations, and then afterwards, subsequently, deviant or antisocial acts, things like vandalism, swearing, fighting, or animal behavior, are discovered, quote-unquote, by police, the judiciary, the press, and these acts are used to explain the subculture's original transgression of sartorial codes. So you, you see someone with a three-foot mohawk and a safety pin through their nose, and you're like, why do they dress like that? And then later you see examples of vandalism, swearing, fighting. Uh, you know, this, this always reminds me of the mosh pits that were popular when I was a kid, right, where people would uh, dance by slamming into each other and beating each other up. And people would look at that and say, oh, that's just terrible. That explains why they look so crazy, right? Uh, and, and so he says either one of these things then can result in a kind of moral panic. Uh, where people look at this, oh my God, this is terrible, you know, we, we look at the, what the kids are doing today, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, there was one of these when I was a kid, again, related to things like mosh pits and heavy metal movements. You know, I was alive during the satanic panic of the 1980s when, you know, I, I can remember a friend of mine uh, whose parents wouldn't let him listen to Kiss records because she honestly believed that Kiss stood for knights in Satan's service and wouldn't let... Uh, you, you know, her son uh, listened to satanic music. Not that it was satanic at all. It was, uh, you know, kisses like four nice Jewish kids from New York. Uh, 
Uh, but you know, the point is, is that people do get worked up into these kinds of moral panics, and and they're based in large part on differences, first off, in appearance, and secondly, in in behavior. So he continues, and this is where things get interesting and a little tricky. He tells us, as the subculture begins to strike its own eminently marketable pose, as its vocabulary, both visual and verbal, become more and more familiar, so the referential context to which it can be most conveniently assigned is made increasingly apparent. Thus, punks are brought back into line. So what happens is, as, as the subculture catches on, uh, you know, this is what he means by the eminently marketable pose and so on, and as its vocabulary becomes more, more familiar. What happens is that, that people look at the people like the punks, at subcultures like the punks, and, and they make a, kind of a, a, a cognitive decision to bring them back into line. So the boys in lipstick just become kids dressing up, girls in rubber skirts or daughters just like yours, right? And he calls this recuperation. So it's... It, you know, it's not, it's kind of like co-opting, but it's a little different. And, and so he tells us recuperation takes two forms. The conversion of subcultural signs into mass-produced objects. So we commodify the difference, right? And then the labeling and redefinition of deviant behavior by dominant groups. So by the police, the media, the judiciary, etc. So again, as, as the subcultural movements become more familiar, more widespread, more marketable, people recuperate these movements. And, and they sort of, by recuperating them, they're made less dangerous in some way, right? It's just kids dressing up. It's not, you know, boys in lipstick aren't scary anymore. So once the moral panic kind of subsides a little bit, right, we get in the recuperation phase. And one way we, we recuperate is through the commodity form. And so think about this, like the leather jackets that, uh, you know, the leather motorcycle jackets that, that are marketed by the high fashion houses now, that in the 1950s were symbolic of being a one percenter, part of a motorcycle gang, right? What they did was they took the, the, the sartorial expression of this group, which was a rebellious group of criminals, and adopted it, co-opted it, and marketed it. Right? And now no one thinks twice when they see someone in a leather motorcycle jacket. Right, So that's the commodity form. But then there's the ideological reform. And this is the redefinition of deviant behavior, part of what you see up here. So again, here's your commodity form. He says, subcultural style begins by issuing symbolic challenges. Here are the symbolic challenges. Right, You have this young woman, uh, you know, crazy makeup, crazy hair, uh, studded dog collar, swastika is on her shirt, right? But uh, Hebdige observes, however, by, they end by establishing new sets of conventions. They become co-opted, mass-produced, they become public property, and are made comprehensible in the commodity form. So what was once really dangerous and, and really edgy becomes co-opted and worn by Miley Cyrus, right? By Hannah Montana. And at this point, of course, it's no longer dangerous. So what's happened here is a co-opting of subcultural style. So this look that, that was noise, that was antithetical to the, the mainstream dominant culture, gets brought into the dominant culture, becomes commodified, is mass-produced and put out for sale, and ultimately all of the kind of edginess of it and the dangerousness of it is discharged. It goes away. And so, you know, there's no better example, of course, than Hannah Montana with a mohawk in her butt hanging out of spiked leather shorts. Now, with the ideological form, he tells us the way in which subcultures are represented in the media makes them both more and less exotic than they actually are. They're seen to contain both dangerous aliens and boisterous kids, wild animals and wayward pets. And so, again, he, he finds two ways in which people deal with this other, capital O, right, the members of this subcultural group. And he says they can be trivialized, naturalized, or domesticated, which is difference denied. Or they can be transformed into meaningless exotica, a spectacle, or clowns, a kind of difference beyond understanding. So, you know, the trivialized, naturalized, and domesticated is, you know, when, when your daughter comes home with a mohawk and, the, and so on, uh, 
in the 1970s in England, you know, you just say, ah, well, you know, she's just going through a phase, right? That's the trivialization, trivialization of it. The transformation into meaninglessness, that's, that's a little bit more complicated, but one example of that would be there was a, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, and there was a street in Philadelphia known as South Street, and this is where all the punks and, uh, you know, deviants hung out. Uh, and, you know, people used to go to South Street to go, like, like, it was a tourist spot, right, to go people watching. And the whole idea behind that is this idea that it's spectacle, where you go and watch it, like you go to the movies, right? And the people are so different at least seemingly in terms of the way that they look and present themselves. And, and this was the time when people had like the three foot mohawks and, you know, purple hair and, you know, not that people don't have purple hair now, but I mean, it was quite radical, quite different. And so it was kind of a tourist attraction. And people visiting the city of Philadelphia would go, you know, hang out down on South Street. And this was, you know, a difference beyond understanding. And so these are the two ways that Hebdige sees culture dealing with subcultures. Now, this is the part that really interests me and the, and, and the part that hopefully will be interesting to you as well. You know, Hebdige is really focused in this, in the excerpts I gave you on sartorial expression and sartorial communication. And this is communicating by the way you dress. Now, of course, when we think communication, we think of people talking or broadcasting or mass media. But, you know, we're all communicating all the time. And we're, we're like transmitters that can never be turned off to a certain extent. And one of the ways that we communicate is through the choice of what we wear. Now, this can be intentional, but it doesn't have to be. Indeed, as, as Hebdige observes, signification doesn't have to be intentional. Every object can be viewed as a sign. And he says, each ensemble has its place in an internal system of differences, the conventional modes of sartorial discourse, which fit a corresponding set of socially prescribed roles and options. And you can see that here in these examples, right? I, I mean, these are the preps. These are the, uh, the, well, this is the cast of Jersey Shore, right? Uh, but, you know, they're clearly from different social classes, different socioeconomic groups, different uh, religious affiliations in all likelihood, different educational backgrounds. And they, they dress and style their, their hair and so on in very different ways that express a kind of uh, social prescription, right? In other words, like, I'm part of this group. Oh, well, I'm part of this group. And so as a result, you dress in a certain way, right? This is the whole acid wash jeans, uh, you know, trucker hat kind of, uh, you know, early 2000s, late 90s phenomena. And this is like the uh, Brooks Brothers, J. Crew, uh, you know, Ivy kind of uh, phenomena, right? And and both of these groups of people are clearly dressing in such a way so as to communicate this set of socially prescribed roles. And so Hebdige goes on and says, choices about what we wear contain a whole range of messages which are transmitted through the finely graded distinctions of a number of interlocking sets, class, status, self-image, attractiveness, etc. right? So, so what he's saying is that the choice of clothes is, is really, you know, a very nuanced form of communication that speaks to all these different issues that I just mentioned, right? The social class, education level, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, religious affiliations, uh, attractiveness. Um, I mean, in theory, your clothes even say something about your morality, right? And, 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 and your, your, your moral status, so, you know, Hebdige is right to observe that clothing says much more about us than, than what people typically recognize when they go to the store. Although, at the same time, I'll also submit to you that we do have certainly a, a kind of innate understanding about what clothes say about us. Otherwise, people wouldn't spend, you know, well, my son wants a pair of Jordan 4s, for example. You know, they're like 300 bucks, man, 400 bucks. You know, people wouldn't spend three, 400 hours on a pair of sneakers unless they had a, a very finely honed kind of innate understanding about the power of sartorial expression. All right, so Hebdige says, you know, ask the question, what makes subcultural style different? And he says that subcultural style, styles are obviously fabricated, so it's a form of intentional communication. He says they display their own codes, or at least demonstrate the codes are meant to be used and abused, so they're, they're perfectly willing to look at the old sartorial clothing, dressing, you know, hairstyling, makeup codes, and violate them, and that's part of it, 
Uh, he says, subcultures reposition and recontextualize commodities by subverting their conventional uses and inventing new ones. So what he's talking about here is taking things that already exist in society and using them in different ways. The perfect example, of course, is the safety pin, right, which is used for piercing and as, you know, lip rings, nose lip rings, earrings, etc. cetera. Uh, and he says, the communication of significant difference, then, is the point behind the style of all spectacular subcultures. So what they're doing, right, is they're expressing difference. You know, this is, this is Hebdige's key point, is that it's, it's expression of difference. And of course, one of the primary ways to express difference is to take something that's always been around and use it in a new way or an unexpected way, like the, like the safety pin. Right? Or, I'm sorry, not the safety pin. The, the, well, yeah, it is a safety pin, I guess. So another thing, and we've talked a lot about bricolage so far, but here we see it again. He says, together, object and meaning constitute a sign. And within any one culture, such signs are assembled repeatedly into characteristic forms of discourse. However, when a bricoleur relocates the significant object in a different position within that discourse, using the same overall repertoire of signs, or when that object is placed within a different total ensemble, a new discourse is, is made, constituted, a different message conveyed. So what he's talking about is, you know, taking the safety pins, taking uh, the household items and using them as part of your uh, dress, as part of your uniform, so to speak, as a punk, is a form of bricolage. And what it does is it creates a new form of discourse, a new form of expression, a new conversation, in essence. And he says that ultimately what's going on is that the punks and other spectacular, quote-unquote, subcultures are engaged in what he calls semiotic guerrilla warfare. They're taking existing signs and, and, and using them to new ends. Indeed, they're engaged in what he calls an assault on the syntax of everyday life. Taking the familiar, reconstituting it, repurposing it, and using it in a new form of expression. And of course, we see this, and we, we've talked about things like this. This, for example, is a, is a sculpture, quote-unquote, it's actually a urinal. Uh, but Marcel Duchamp uh, famously entered this into an art show. He was actually one of the judges of the show. Uh, but he famously put this into an art show. And the idea was that he was taking the urinal and reconstituting it and, and, and putting it out as a piece of art, right? Which is a new form of, of semiotic expression. It's giving it a new semiotic meaning. It's no longer something you pee in. Now it's a work of art, right? Uh, we see the punks uh, very commonly used uh, Nazi symbols. This wasn't because they were anti-Semitic. This wasn't because they, they thought the Nazis were right. It was because these things were still around from the Second World War and because, you know, it was a symbol that everyone knew and they were repurposing it, right, it, to express a kind of nihilism ultimately, right? Uh, we saw the same sort of thing occur in the United States of America uh, during the 1960s. This is, uh, I believe this is Country Joe from Country Joe and the Fish uh, at Woodstock, and he's wearing a, a U.S. Army jacket. Now he's a hippie and he's singing for peace and he's at Woodstock. And the whole hippie movement was about love and it was anti-war. But by wearing the, the army jacket, he's repurposing it. In, in some sense, in the same way that the punks repurpose the, the swastika. Here you see, uh, you know, one of the, uh, this isn't a punk, I don't think. This is one of the teddy boys, if I recall correctly. But wearing, you know, the Union Jack uh, with the portrait of the queen on a leather motorcycle jacket studded with, you know, these metal studs. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, I don't, I shouldn't say of course, uh, I think this is Duchamp again, uh, and, and repurposing the Mona Lisa, right, by, by painting a, a, a mustache and goatee on it, right? So what, what's happening in every one of these cases is that people are taking traditional cultural signs and, and they're, they're doing semiotic warfare with them. They're reconstituting them, repurposing them, and using them for a new form of expression. So he says the punk fashion is actually kind of unfashion, you know, that, that, that uses razor blades, safety pins, tampons, right, in really kinds of dramatic ways to create a kind of uh, what he calls confrontation dressing. It's really in your face. Uh, the faces of the punks are used as abstract portraits, that represent studies in alienation. This is what you see with the dramatic makeup and so on. Dyed hair, fragments of school uniforms, iconography of sexual fetishism with the dog collars and so on. Uh, 
Their dancing is kind of anti-dancing. Dances like the pogo, the pose, and the robot. Uh, they, they discourage overt displays of heterosexual interests. So it's, you know, when you went to one of these punk concerts or, or music halls, there wasn't the kind of, uh, you know, hitting on each other in the, that we see in the meat markets, or I guess you used to see in the meat markets in, in American bars and so on. Uh, the music itself is, is very basic. Uh, you know, the punk musicians tell you that they want to be amateurs. There's a very raw kind of feeling to it all. And, and the punk press, the, the people that wrote the, the, the zines and so on that surrounded this movement used working class language, uh, oftentimes left the proofreading marks in the actual uh, pages. Uh, and, and so as a result, what you get overall is a sense of immediacy and ironic self-abasement. So he says, even though the punk style was all about chaos and, and symbolizing chaos, the style itself was ordered. And together it made a meaningful whole, a homology. And so this is where Hebdige borrows from Paul Willis, and he says, Willis shows how, contrary to myth, which represents subcultures as well as forms, the internal structure of any subculture is characterized by an extreme orderliness. Each part is organically related to other parts, uh, and, and though the fit between them, and is through, sorry, the fit between them, that the subcultural member makes sense of the world. So again, we see this uh, many times in subcultures. One way of thinking about subcultures, and, and typically how I think about them, is, is in terms of high school cliques, which are small kinds of micro subcultures within the larger high school subculture. And of course, you know, if you've been part of a high school clique, that there's a very clear kind of order. You know, someone's in charge, someone's second in charge. There are certain rules that you do, you know. Uh, on Thursdays, we wear pink, right, or whatever it is from Clueless, the movie. There's, there's, you know, there are very well-established rules and a very strict kind of order within the punk movement, even though the whole thing symbolizes chaos. And so this is kind of interesting, right, that there's a kind of rigid orderliness that undergirds these expressions of chaos, which, of course, are, are, are designed in such a way to act as noise and, and sort of uh, jam the, the messages of the dominant culture. Uh, all right. So he, he asked, what does subcultural style signify to members of a subculture? And he says, the answer was that appropriated objects reassembled in, in the subcultural ensembles were made to reflect, express, and resonates aspects of group life. They were objects in which the members could see their central values held and reflected. And so, you know, he finds a homological relationship between the trashy cut up clothes and spiky hair, the dances, the drugs, the spitting, the vomiting, right? All the, the crazy writing in the fanzines. There's a connection that's built in here, right? He says, the punks wore clothes which were the sartorial equivalent of swear words, and they swore as they dressed with calculated effect, lacing obscenities into record notes, publicity releases, interviews, and love songs. It was in, it was in their repurposing, it was through their bricolage, the repurposing of these things, through their confrontational dressing, that there becomes a kind of group homology. In other words, it's, it's, that's what binds them together. Right? They're bound together through confrontation, through bricolage, through repurposing, through, through an aesthetic of, I, I don't even know how to say it, I, through, a, through a kind of base aesthetic, right, there becomes a group membership and a, and a group meaning and a group affiliation. And so ultimately then this, this leads him to think of style as what he calls signifying practice. And now the idea of signifying practice goes back to Hall, Stuart Hall, you remember him, uh, and others in the British uh, cultural studies tradition. And uh, so he says, uh, you know, in defining signifying practice, these are the meaning-making behaviors in which people engage following particular convention of rules of construction or interpretation. So, what you need to understand is that signifying practice is just what it sounds like.
When you engage in signifying practice, you're engaging in behaviors, practices that 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 are that convey meaning, right? Meaning making behaviors. And so This leads Hebdige to say, signifying practices are meaningful cultural practices, cultural parole. They can be distinguished from discourses or discourse in that they are not only linguistic and verbal, but they can be physical or gestural. In culture, people interact to produce meaning. What they produce from ideas and meanings may be, uh, may be labeled signifying practices. The term is coined to explain the main concern of a symbolic study of culture, which is the, different from the positive traditional anthropology. So here's an example of signifying practice. Check this out. Embodied in athletes like Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who turned American sports culture on its head in the late 1960s. There's Cuesta. It's a good start. And Carlos, as usual, has burst out of the blocks. Tommy Smith running pretty well so far. And in lane two, Bombuk is strong on the outside. It's Edwin Roberts. It's John Carlos right now. It's Carlos and Smith. And here comes Tommy Smith. They won a gold and a bronze medal at the 68 Olympics. And what they did next couldn't stand in starker contrast to today's depoliticized, sanitized, and hyper-commercialized sports world. They didn't pull a Jordan at the 1968 Olympics and use their platform on the global stage to protect an endorsement deal. No. These guys had a point to make. As they walked to the platform, they took off their shoes and carried them to protest poverty in America. They wore beads to protest lynching, and John Carlos even unzipped his jacket, a violation of Olympic protocol, to represent, as he told me, his working buddies, black and white, back home in New York City. And in perhaps the most famous gesture in Olympic history, they raised their fists during the national anthem to show solidarity with the civil rights movement. Their symbolic gesture inspired millions around the world, but their punishment was swift and severe. Good morning to you. The Olympic Games are one week old today, and yesterday, the sixth day, was the most dramatic so far. It started with the news that the Black Power disciples Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the Olympic 200 meters gold and bronze medalists, had been suspended by the United States Olympic Committee and given 48 hours to leave Mexico. I had said that if there were any demonstrations at the Olympic Games by anyone, the participants would be sent home. Smith. So, so you see here, these what happened with these athletes at the, the Olympics in Mexico was that they engaged in signifying practice, as as you noticed, hopefully in the in the last slide. You know, Hebdige tells us this can be gestural, and of course, you know, holding up their their fists in you know uh, in honor of the, of the civil rights movement was clearly a gesture, and it was you know, a sign, right? It was a form of communication. And, and so as such can be understood as signifying practice. Now, of course, these are extreme examples, uh, you know, but there are, there are much uh, less noticeable kinds of examples of signifying practice that happen all the time. Indeed, this is what Hebdige is talking about when he talks about how clothing and the choices you make about the clothes you wear uh, speak to your affiliation with different groups and, and, and socioeconomic status and education and so on. Right? So every time you wake up in the morning and you put on the clothes you're wearing, even if you're not consciously thinking about it, you're engaged in a kind of form of signifying practice. So he says that, that punk in particular, when it comes to signifying practice, is hard to read. And so he turns to another scholar, Julia Kristeva, and her notion of radical signifying practices. And these are signifying practices or, or gestures or behaviors that negate and disturb syntax, that, that disturb coherence and rationality. And so Hebb did suggest the signifying practices embodied in punk were radical in Kristeva's sense because they gestured towards a nowhere and actively sought to remain, uh, remain silent, inscrutable, right? The people, you know, part of the idea behind punk was that people shouldn't be able to figure it out easily and that it shouldn't make sense, right? Indeed, punk refused to make sense, and instead was really at base and just uh, simply an assertion of otherness with the capital O, right? So, you know, there was no kind of resolution of, of contradictions, right? 
rather the the punk was an experience of co contradiction itself, right? And this this was manifested in visual puns and so on. He tells us the punk style fitted together homo homological, hom uh, dear Lord, homologically, precisely through its lack of fit. So you know, there's holes in the T-shirt. Um, you know, the 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 uh, repurposing things like uh, bin liners as you know trash bags as garments. Um, you know, there was this whole idea that there, there, there was a refusal to cohere around an identi identifiable set of central values. Instead, he says it cohered elliptically through a change of conspicuous absences. It was characterized by an unlocatedness, a blankness. Now, he goes on, he says, not all subcultures play with language to the same extent. Some are more straightforward than others. But in the punk movement, certainly, the, the, the punk movements. The thing that bound it together, the thing, the thing that created the punk homology, if you will, this this binding together of people, were, was in some sense its own inability to reason with itself, right? That this kind of contradictoriness that that runs through it, what he what he calls a lack of fit, right? The holes in the t-shirt, spitting instead of applause, wearing trash bags, anarchy over order, and so on. And, 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 there was, and it's just general lack of willingness to, to go here, right? And indeed, in some sense, it was this lack of, of easy affiliation that created the togetherness and the affiliation within the subcultural group itself. So it's... I mean, this is an interesting argument, I think, and, and one of the most interesting that we've read all this semester. And for the record, you know, Hebdige, uh, as far as I know, never completed his PhD. Uh, this was his MA thesis, and of course he went on to, to teach and have a, have a fantastic career at, at a fantastic school like UC Berkeley. So it just shows you how significant this book was when it came out. Uh, it, it is, in essence, it made, it, it made his career. I mean, it's the, you know, book that that sort of jump-started a, a, a beautiful academic and very successful academic career uh, and got him accepted by a, a notoriously kind of uh, cloisterish kind of group of people without the full, uh, you know, PhD and so on. So, so this is a really influential work and, and also, I think, really interesting and, and, you know, honestly, just a cool one, right? I mean, there's something that's just really cool about uh, Hebdige and, and this particular particular movement. All right. Well, that's it. I uh, thank you for checking out my lecture. And uh, this was the last one. So thank you for checking out all my lectures. And uh, thanks for a great semester.